Today we want to talk about double displacement reactions, but not only double displacement reactions, because we can recognize those fairly easily, but then what does that mean or what do we do with it? And solubility then becomes uh, the big thing that we are going to have to deal with and keep, in, keep track of and, and keep in mind. So if we remind ourselves about a double displacement reaction, it, you start out with two compounds. That's one of the key differences between a double displacement reaction and a single displacement reaction. In a single displacement reaction, the pattern is compound element, compound element, whereas in a double displacement reaction, it's compound, 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 compound. Now you can either think of it as the two first things switching around, switching places, or the two second things switching places. But one of the key things is if the, well let's call it A, but if our element that is showing up first in the first compound, it is still going to be the first element in the second, uh, sorry, in the, on the product side. So what I mean by that is if you have a metal non-metal compound as A, B, and compound C, D is also a metal non-metal compound, then the, the when you switch the, uh, the things around it in a double displacement reaction, you're going to keep metal non-metal type compounds. So, and that's saying in words what I just sort of tripped my way through in, uh, in speaking it. Um, the other thing that's kind of important when we get to the point of predicting products is that the charge of the metals are not going to change. So even if you have metals where the, you can have more than one possible charge on that metal, it's not going to change the charge as it goes through a double displacement reaction. It will stay the same. So in the case of something like this, where if you look at copper, oops, too far. Uh, if you look at copper and iron, copper has a charge on the reactant side of plus two, and iron has a charge of plus three. Those charges stay the same, so when you are predicting products, you have to make sure that the compounds on the product side match up or are correct for the charges on those metals, which come from the reactant side. Okay, to go off a little bit of a tangent, um, and, and leading ourselves into solubility is when you have a ionic compound, uh, an ionic compound is normally going to be a solid at room temperature. A pure ionic compound will be a solid at room temperature. It's very, they tend to have very, very high melting points as well. So the other thing you can do with them is dissolve them. And if you have them dissolved, then they're going to exist at low, sorry, at, uh, as separated ions, but some of them aren't soluble. So if you mix them with water, they don't really dissolve, or they only dissolve a tiny little bit to the point where you really can't notice it. So I know that looks redundant, but what will I do is we'll identify compounds as having low solubility or high solubility. And if they have low solubility, that means we can pretty much ignore the solubility and say that they don't really dissolve. And that's going to become important in a few minutes. Okay. Now, that is going to be true if they are added to water. So I start with a compound, I dump it in water, stir it up, it doesn't really dissolve very much. Or if I have a reaction where that compound is one of the products. So everything might start out really nicely dissolved, but by the time I'm done doing my double displacement reaction, I end up with a compound that is a product that does not dissolve or it has low solubility. Okay, if you're looking at the textbook on page 173, you're going to see this chart. I tried to re reproduce it. There's a few things that if I were to hand this to you on a test or a quiz or something like that, I would probably want to change it just because things that we don't often need and don't often deal with, uh, they show up on here in a way that kind of ends up being a bit of a confusing thing. But if you kind of look at this chart, it's divided into two main sections. Top section are the compounds or the combinations, I should say, that end up being very soluble, so they dissolve quite well. And the bottom section is the ones that are not very soluble. Now this says slightly soluble. We can kind of think of it as ones that do not dissolve very well. So if you put them into water, they will stay in solid form. They will not dissolve. After that, moving one column to the right, the middle column, we list these things by the negative ion, the anions. And then from there, we start looking at the final column for exceptions. So in other words, if I look at the very top, NO3, what it says is that NO3 ion, all of them are soluble. It's all in the soluble section and they are soluble. And there are no exceptions to that. If I drop one down to the CL and other halides, so bromide, iodide, 
most of them are soluble. There's a small list of exceptions, but most are soluble. Also very soluble are most compounds of SO4, 2 minus charge. There's a few exceptions. It looks like kind of a long list of exceptions, but it's a still a smaller list than the ones that are soluble. Sorry, uh, yeah, soluble. Okay, if I look at the bottom section, I'm going to go right to the bottom uh, where it says S2 minus, so sulfide. Most sulfide compounds are low solubility or slightly soluble because the whole section there is on slightly soluble. The exceptions, the ones that are not slightly soluble, or in other words, the ones that are soluble, are group one, so that's a lithium sodium bromine, sorry, lithium sodium potassium, not sure where bromine came from, uh, group one, the alkali metals, and group two, so your, uh, your magnesium calcium strontium, your group two metals, and then this other one here, NH4 or one plus. Those ones are the exception to the slightly soluble pattern. Okay, so let's use that. So what we have is FeCl3. So I have a compound. What I'm going to do is I'm going to go to the table. I'm going to find Cl. Cl is near the top. It's in the very soluble section. And then I'm going to look for um, iron in the exceptions group. Well, iron does not show up in the exceptions group, which means it follows the main pattern, which means FeCl3, iron 3 chloride, has high solubility, or it would be very soluble. If I try a similar thing with CuOH uh, taken twice, okay, we may not have done nomenclature of that yet, it doesn't really matter. I'm going to go to the table again. I'm going to find the OH ion, it's down near the bottom, so it's in the slightly soluble, which means I don't expect it to have very high solubility. Uh, I know there's exceptions to the pattern, so I'm looking for copper, Cu, in the slightly, sorry, in that. Uh, in that row. I don't see it. I see group 1, NH4, calcium, strontium, barium. I don't see copper, which means copper follows the main pattern of being slightly soluble. I've labeled it as low solubility. Doing the same thing again for PBSO4, that taken twice, same thing. Go to the table, I find SO4, it's near the top again. So most of those are, high, uh, show, are very soluble. And now I'm looking for PB in there. Now, I do see a PB, but if I look carefully, SO4 says it's a minus 2 ion, and the PB uh, that I'm working with has two of those. So if each SO4 is a minus 2, and I've got two of them, I've got a total of minus 4. I think I said that wrong. If it's each one is minus 2, and I've got two of them, it's minus 4 is total, which means my PB is plus 4 total, that PB, that lead ion, is a plus 2. So but following the table as it stands, I would actually have to say that that one shows high solubility. Uh, might be a bit of a, a weird thing with the table, but that's how I would have to do it. Okay, if I take it back to double displacement reactions, I can take a double displacement reaction and I can predict the products. We did that earlier a little bit, not a whole lot. But if I take this one and I start to work with my charges to make sure that the charges do not change, this is what I end up with. Okay, now, next job is to look at those products, those products, find both of them on the solubility table. I don't have to worry about the reactants, just the products. Find them both on the solubility table and identify them as either being high solubility, very soluble, or low solubility, slightly soluble, and I end up with that. Okay. Uh, from there, oops, uh, that means that I've produced a compound that does not dissolve very much. Well, what is that going to look like? What's going to happen is, as I mix two solutions, solutions that are generally clear and colorless, or at least clear, I can see through them, uh, I'm going to form something that forms a solid, and that is going to be a precipitate, which makes the whole mixture kind of cloudy and I can't see through it. And then if one of those products is a precipitate, it's going to cloud the whole mixture. If neither of those products are a precipitate, it won't. And you might wonder, well, what happens if both of them are? I've never found an example where that happens. And if you were to look at a picture of what that would look like, if you take a look at the, the two things that are being mixed, both of them look like water. They're clear, they're colorless. And where they come into contact and where they react and form the product, that is a yellow 
a solid, it's not a big chunk of course, it's more of a powdery substance at this point, but I cannot see through it. That's a precipitate. And a precipitate is always going to be a product. Okay, what I want you to do is I want you to pause the video, I want you to, to check out a solubility table, the one in the textbook, or, or uh, maybe you want to rewind for a little bit or something like that, and identify the ones that are precipitates here. Or maybe they don't have one at all. Okay, and we'll check back in a second. Hopefully you paused it, um, but if you were to look at the solubility table here, then you would have ended up identifying silver SO4, so that the, uh, the second product there, as having low solubility. You would have identified BaCO3 as having low solubility or being slightly soluble, being the precipitate, and same thing with the last one, although that should look kind of familiar. We saw that one before. Okay. That wraps up double spacing reactions and solubility. Other than getting a whole lot more practice with the, the solubility table, you should be able to read that table. I've got a couple of different versions. We'll find one that works best, uh, but we'll probably stick with the one that's in the textbook. And you should be able to identify a compound on its own as uh, where, where it falls in the solubility table and also identify precipitate in a double displacement reaction. And after that, we'll talk to you another time.